Then elder, effective elder boards and church boards or deacon boards need to protect. First, they need to protect the vision and the values of the church. There are usually those clear statements of what the values are, the core values. There is often a core value statement. The pastor and the elders work together to have a clear vision. And it's the board's responsibility to protect that. Secondly, effective elder boards protect the elder board itself. They have to be on the watch for what's happening among themselves and among God's people. And here, effective elders need to learn to discern the difference between catfish, dragons, and wolves. Paul warns of wolves. I've, ran, I've run into them. They're described in Acts chapter 20, but not every problem in the church is a wolf. In fact, one of the problems that can happen is the problem of a catfish. Chuck Swindoll writes of this in a very interesting way, that in the Northeast United States, codfish are not only a delectable food, they're also a commercial business. And there's a market in the eastern half of the United States for codfish, and they're sent all over the East Coast. But there was a problem in shipping the codfish. At first, they would freeze these fish and ship them everywhere, but they, the fish lost their flavor. So then somebody came up with the idea of shipping them in a tank of seawater. But that, got even, that was even worse. The cod lost their flavor. They became soft and mushy. And then somebody came up with a brilliant idea. In their natural habitat, codfish are chased around by catfish. And so what these shippers did is they had a big tank. They put the codfish in the tank. And then they put a catfish in the tank. And all during that trip, that catfish was chasing those codfish all over the tank so that by the time the fish arrived at market, they were fresh, they were lively, they were flopping all over the place because there was a catfish in the tank. And that metaphor should warn us and remind us that the, in our own lives as Christians, God will sometimes put a catfish in our tank. Somebody who's snapping at us, someone who is hard to be around, someone who's irritating. But God's desire is that we become more and more like Christ, and that's why that catfish is there. Same thing happens in churches. Sometimes leaders have catfish snapping at their heels, complaining about this or pointing out that. And it's easy to think, well, maybe they're a wolf. Maybe I need to eliminate them from the church. No, God put them there as a catfish to keep us fresh and new and changing. So one of the ways that elders protect themselves and the church is to discern, are they dealing with a catfish or are they dealing with a dragon? A dragon is a mythical creature, of course, but... Churches have dragons. Within the church, dragons are sincere, well-meaning believers who leave strained relationships and hard feelings. They are hot about what they believe. They singe people's ears and hair with their hot breath. They act a little bit strange. But they're not wolves. They're not trying to divide the church. They're just a little odd. They're dragons. And we need to learn how to 
not let them disrupt things, but we also don't need to drive them away. We need to put boundaries on them so that they don't strain too many relationships. Because churches do have catfish that leaders don't like, but God has providentially put them there. And churches do have dragons that sometimes people get tired of, but God has providentially put them there that we can grow in our unconditional love. And then church boards also have to protect against wolves. And in Acts chapter 20, Paul describes the wolf. We have a whole session on the wolf called the staff infection. Wolves distort the truth. Wolves divide the flock. And we looked at Titus chapter 3, verse 10. We need to warn a divisive person once, warn a wolf twice, and then if they end up being indeed a wolf who's going to distort the truth and keep doing it and divide the flock and keep doing it, then we need to beg off from them. We need, we need to have nothing more to do with them. We remove them from leadership. If they're a member, perhaps remove them from membership because a twice-warned wolf who continues on with his behavior must be addressed. And this is one of the roles of an elder board to protect the church. And finally, one of the roles of the elder board is to protect their pastor, the overseer of the church. And to keep in mind that God has sent them and that they need to learn to work together with them and that they need to understand perhaps how God has designed them and protect them in the way that they've been made. I went to a conference back in 2007 and a pastor named Mark Driscoll of Mars Hill Church out in the Seattle, Washington area gave a lecture that has stayed with me and that I've used countless times. He said that as he's watched emerging leaders within his church, he's observed that there are three kinds of emerging leaders. And I see that there are often three different kinds of pastors that I deal with. The first is that some leaders are like priests. The second is that some leaders are like prophets. And the third is that some leaders are like kings. Let's look at each one of these. Some emerging leaders, men and women, are like priests. They care about people. Their ministry is all about loving relationships. They have a close relationship with the Lord and with other people. They stand with people in the storm. They're there in a hurting marriage to counsel. They're there in a broken-hearted home when some tragedy has come. They're a priest. They come alongside. They bring healing. They bring help. They care about people. Sometimes they love to preach the Bible and teach the Bible. Sometimes, though, they're not quite as good because they're really better with people than they are with preaching. They're priests, and people will follow them anywhere, oftentimes because that priestly good shepherd walked with them through the storms of life. And then there are prophets. Where priests love people, prophets love to preach. And so while priests love to be around relationships, prophets like to go to the library, they like to be alone, they like to write, they like to meditate, they like to explore. They want to shine forth God's truth in creative ways, which is the core meaning of the idea of being prophetic. And oftentimes people will flock to their preaching and churches can grow if the pastor is a prophet and is gifting. And people live with the fact that sometimes these people dress in kind of strange clothes like John the Baptist or eat food that's kind of strange like he did. And sometimes they're administratively challenged, but they're so good at proclaiming God's truth that they can have a great ministry. And then there's others who are more wired to be kings. Where priests love people and prophets love to preach, kings love to lead. 
Ministry is about developing the organization for them. They love to cast a clear vision. They love to have clear goals. They love to delegate. They love to measure. They love statistics. They love to see how things are developing and make sure that things are on the growth path and find the the S-curve pivot. People put up with the fact that they only have sometimes a few friends, that they're not the most friendly of people, but they're very effective in giving oversight to the whole organization. They're like kings. Now, I've discovered that sometimes people are a hybrid of two of these, but seldom are they strong in all three. And at the same time, when I went to this lecture, I was warned afterwards when I talked about how I thought it was so great by a friend. And he said, now remember, Rick, Christ is prophet, priest, and king, and we are to follow him and we're to develop in all three of these areas. We're to develop as a priest who loves people. We're to develop as a prophet who shines forth God's truth. We're to develop as a king who's able to lead whatever we're responsible for. And he was right. We can't use a strength that we've been given to justify writing off another one of these areas. But what I've discovered is, is that elder boards can protect their pastor when they understand how he's wired. And if he's more of a priest, then they don't expect him to be the greatest preacher in town. And if he's more of a great preacher, then they don't try to force him to be a great administrator. Because there are different gifts, there are different roles, there are different strengths, and once again, a complementary team on an elder board is the best approach, where there's several prophets, perhaps, and several priests and several kings working together for a very balanced ministry that glorifies Jesus Christ, who is indeed our prophet, priest, and king. Jesus Christ, who is indeed our king, our lawgiver, and our judge. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com.